we are very honored to have with us. Uh, you know, sometimes we travel around the world. Here we didn't have to go too far. So our very own here, Rabbi Shmuel Nuttick, who is the director of Free throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, and we want to thank him so much uh, for joining us. Thank you, Rabbi. And everybody's busy and Yuntif and preparations and so on. So we really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we want to hear about a little bit your own personal life story, uh, growing up in the former Soviet Union and what that was like. It feels like an ancient memory to us now, but I think everybody here remembers what it was like when that was the obsession of the Jewish world, was uh, helping Jews in the Soviet Union. And then if you could share with us also a little bit about what it was like to get out of uh, of Russia and come to Eretz Yisrael and then to America and all that stuff. So we have loads of questions, but if you don't mind to just give us a little bit of background, tell us your childhood story and a little bit about what your family life was like growing up in, a, in that uh, in that environment. You know, I'm named after my grandfather. And my grandfather was named after the Rabbi Marash. And my grandfather was a student of the Lubavitch Yeshiva in Lubavitch. <clears throat> and when he got married, he didn't have children, and Rabbi Rashab uh, made him uh, understand that if he becomes a Rav in one of the cities in Belarus, a Kopich, he will be able to father a child, and that's how my father was born. And not, you know, me and even my father, we never saw a Rebbe in in the Russia and we were just raised by Sidim uh, or my father was raised uh, by his father by my grandfather but we we never knew what what a rabbi is all about but we just were raised that there is a rabbi there is a nasi and that uh, you know he always has us in mind that was before we knew that the Rebbe was crying on the Fabrengans and very much the Russian, the, the plight of the Russian Jews was very much on his, on his mind. And he was uh, praying and fighting for the fact that Jews in general should be able to leave Russia, especially the city. But um, while on the side of the Sidim, which is us, our families, and even little children, we were raised like we would have Chassidish Fabrengans. What was the discussion of Fabrengans? How certain Chassidim throughout the history of, um, of the Soviet Union, how they risked their life, or they, or they actually unfortunately were uh, shot or uh, killed, or died in in the in you know in the Soviet jail like my grandfather, like we were raised on Messiris Nefesh. Sacrifice, self-sacrifice. So Messiris Nefesh and um and believe in the Nosi Hador and believe in the in the Rebbe, that the Rebbe is there for us, and he feels our plight and our pain, and he is our strength and our dependency. And that actually was not something that was, uh, uh, you know, discussed among adults. It was discussed in, uh, in an open forum in a way that, um, you know, the families, even ch little children, young children, all knew that the concept of a, of a rabbi to the extent that, um, you know, I was uh, an underground observant uh, child, but nonetheless, I looked Jewish, and at times they found my tzitzis and so on. So, you know, in a hostile environment and in, in the Soviet Union, I was, uh, I, you know, I would have to fight or run or be beaten. So I, I had difficult, uh, it was a difficult life almost on a daily basis, at some point, I sort of were the loss. 
Well, that was the first thought. The second thought was, uh, well, we have a rabbi. And the rev and it was not something that I was, uh, you know, taught to think that way. It was just a natural from all the stories you hear. There was something, oh, I'm not alone. And while I'm running away or while I'm fighting back, the rev is there with me and I'm not alone. And that gave me that courage to move on in life and to, and it was, I believe, you know, there's a Hasidic saying, whenever you uh, you have like a Meshicha, a pull towards the Rebbe, it's very often that it's not your uh, effort, but it's the Rebbe's effort. In other words, the Rebbe thinks of you, and therefore, you feel a mishicha to the rabbi. And therefore, you know, many years later, I regretted that I was on Yechidas, and it still is on my mind, and I didn't thank the rabbi for thinking of me, and that gave me the courage that I that I wasn't alone. It wasn't my thought as a child. It was something that the rabbi thought of me, and therefore, it came to me that thinking. So, you know, we are uh, today, it's almost 30 years since Gimel Tamos. And the Rebbe's passing. Huh? Saying, I'm explaining to everybody, Gimel Tamos is the Rebbe's passing. The Rebbe's yeah, Rebbe's the passing, passing of the Rebbe. So it's some, one might say, you know, well, how am I, how am I to connect to somebody that's physically not here for 30 years. And it's interesting that, you know, when I got the call from from Rabbi Epstein, it was to ask me for Tuesday night. Tuesday night is when we have a shear, a class for in the Rabbi's teachings. And I try to, you know, when we learn, I ask the people to repeat back what they heard. And I help them to make to make uh, to to really understand it a little bit more closer to the text, what the Rebbe is really trying to say, because I believe that it's the Rebbe's teachings and the Rebbe's memoriam that help us to connect not only to ourselves and our Jewishness and our observance and our complete and sincere uh, connection. To, to Terra Mitzvah and to Jewishness, but more so to connect to the author, to the Rebbe himself, because he provides that process, that thinking, that way to connect to his Neshama is through his Terra. So we almost like, uh, periodically, I would ask the people, well, so how, how do you see connected to the, to the writer? to the author, to the rabbit, to the one that just said the mimer. So that helps us that the, the rabbi and his teachings is something that's relevant and, and it's present. I think well, I spoke too long. I'm going to open up for questions. Yeah, well, well you know, we're, uh, everyone here is Americans. We grew up and we remember in the 60s and 70s all about pre Soviet Jewry. Um, we're basically a bunch of uh, American spoiled couch potatoes here. Give us a, a sense, if you could, like, how did your family get out of Russia? Like, what was that process like? What year was it? And how did it ultimately happen? Uh, I don't want to bring up any sad, bad memories. But if you could share with us from your perspective, you know, we were here in America and everybody was uh, writing to their congressmen and protesting or whatever it was in their own way trying to help Soviet Jewry. Well, can you tell us what it was like on the inside and how, in fact, ultimately your family was able to leave? Well, nobody can leave the Soviet Union. But if there is some outside of the country that sends an invitation and wants to have a, a, a family connection, a family union, there is a chance you can get out. So it became much uh, a little bit easier the concept in the 60s. So in 64, my family, my parents, 
you know, started applying, getting an invitation from my aunt, Olava Sholem, from Eretz Yisrael. And we were able to apply twice a year. And every time it was a rejection. And uh, we, and I remember one time there was a rejection and my father felt very lost. And it was like really in the middle of, in the middle of Sukkot. And he couldn't, uh, he couldn't even uh, celebrate Simplastera. He was like sleeping through. He was not himself. And at some point, we even got an interesting story. We even got a heroi from the Rebbe. An instruction from the Rebbe. Yeah, an instruction from the Rebbe. The way, the way it usually would work, an instruction from the Rebbe is we would be told the grandfather, the Zayda, said that we should stay in Russia because the, we, we, we started doing what what Chabad is doing in the free world, started bringing people closer to Yiddishkeit. The Rebbe wouldn't agree that we should uh, we should stay, we should so, leave. So the, ter- the Zayda is code for the Rebbe. Is, right. is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Just to help everyone understand. So we that. started it actually uh, as becoming more and more established. But you know, the desire to get out, the desire for my parents to have me in the yeshiva, and the desire we saw there's no future in Russia, we kept on asking again. And finally, the Rebbe agreed. And although he agreed, a year and a half later, he was complaining publicly why we left. We should have stayed there to continue spreading Yiddishkeit. Wow. So what year were you able to, to leave? What was we were that able like? To leave in 1971. So what was that like when you finally were told that you could leave? I mean, what what was that process like? You okay. just left the next day, a week? I mean, how, how no, no, that they, usually, they usually give you about uh, 10 weeks, two months to 10 weeks. That gives you a chance to sell whatever you have and to take with you whatever you can. And they, they don't let you take cash or change it into dollars or able to just buy furniture, clothing, things of that nature. But you cannot take out, couldn't take out any any cash, any money with you. So when you leave Russia, where do you go to? Where, where do you, what, you get on a plane, you take a, a train? How does it work? I mean, what is this process? Like, just Okay, know. well, we lived in Uzbekistan. That's Today it's a separate country, then it was a republic. And we took a plane to Moscow. Had you ever been on a plane before? Yeah. Uh-huh, okay. We're just getting a feel for it, okay. Yeah, no, no, it's, the Soviet Union is... It was a country that didn't give you the freedom, but it was a developed country. It's not a third world country. Okay. It wasn't developed as the West, but it was, you know, reasonably developed. There's, there's roads, and there's, uh, I'm not sure there's highways, but there's roads and cars mm-hmm. and planes and uh, factories and, and so on. So it's, you know, civil, if you come there as a tourist, you would feel maybe there's a little bit falling behind, but not significantly. It's not like you're coming in to some, you know, desert in Africa. That's mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a civilized, it's, it's a reasonably civilized society. Whatever was uncivilized was in the in the hiding. It wasn't in the open. Mm-hmm. So in 1971, we were able to leave. I mean, I, I how much time do we have? We're listening. <laughs> you keep talking. I mean, we're uh, I'll just give, you, I'll just give you like a little bit of a background because I, I, I thought you would uh, have questions and answers. But, you know, we lived in Samarkand. And in Samarkand, my father, you know, being that he was a, a product of Lubavitch education, so he immediately made a... a a mikveh in his, in our home, in his house, and he established an underground yeshiva. And my mother was the, the mother and the cook for the boys, and we had boys from all over Russia, 
um, you know, we had like another home in the house, in the yard, uh, which was like a temporary ho housing. We housed at the yeshiva and older students were teachers of the younger kids. And uh, I was, I, I went to the Soviet school, mm -hmm. scholar. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I have to take this call one second. It's... All right, sure. We'll meet you for a minute and we'll come back. To Hi, you. Uh, I'm in the middle of class. Can I call you back in a little bit? <laughs> for a minute? Thank you. <clears throat> And, yeah, so trying to go get back. So I had to, I had to, I had to be going to school. I was forced to go to school. So in, uh, you know, in school, they wanted us to. You cannot wear a hat, a hat cover. No, you cannot wear a yarmulke. And you have to go to school six days a week, which includes Shabbos. So my mother convinced the teacher that I'm a weak boy and I need to have a head covering. And I had to sit, therefore I need to sit in a yarmulke and I need to have two days off a week. But when my brother went to school, that game never worked. It didn't continue to work. And... <clears throat> At that moment, they first of all, she wouldn't let me sit with the yarmulke. And uh, they started demanding we have to go to, to come to, to school on Shabbos. And of course, that we were not going to do. And we were invited to the prosecutor's office. So on the way, uh, my father asked me, what are you going to say? I said to my father, don't worry, I'll say the right things. I'll say that, you know, grandma, she was no longer alive. I I made an oath to my grandmother that I will keep Shabbos. Therefore, according to the, you know, the, there is the written law and there's the law where it's practiced in the Soviet Union. So the written law is anybody could be religious. You cannot... You cannot proselytize religion. You cannot uh, educate anybody, including your kids. But if the kid wants to be a Jewish, they could be Jewish. I said, my grandmother taught me how to uh, to be a Shema Shabbos, and therefore I, uh, I'm not going to skill on Shabbos. And <clears throat> in the Soviet system, they teach you as a child little child that uh, you know Lenin and uh, communists that's the truth that's the ideal of humanity and you make an oath to be faithful to the country and to the party and that you will defend it with everything you have including to put at risk your life and they did it even to little kids, you know, seven, eight year olds would make that oath. Being that I was a religious child, I was not easily invited into that process. So, but I looked at it and I was like, when they made the oath, it reminded me the oath that we have as Jews, we learn in Tanya that the quotes that the Talmud that you that before the child is born, he makes an oath to make him an oath that he will be a righteous man, he will not be a sinful man. Now, here I see it in front of me. I was very moved by that experience. It really brought back what I learned at home. So, you know, that didn't end the process, the process continued. So, on the break, the teacher takes me on the side and says to me, you know, if you 
come to school on Shabbos. I will be, I will give you private tutoring. You'll be the best student in town. You have the capability and you'll be able to do that. So as she's preaching, I'm thinking, what am I going to say that to her that could, I could get out of it? So I say to her the same song that I made an oath to my grandmother. So um, she says to me, I mean, she, she, she had the audacity to say it to me. You know, she says to me, your grandmother is dead. She's rotting her way in the ground. You're a young child. The future is ahead of you. So what are you going to, you know, consider yourself with your oath? She's long dead. I'm thinking as she's preaching, I'm thinking, what do I do now? How do I, how do I play the game further? And, I, and you know, hearing so many stories of Hasidim and uh, in the house, all the everything was in the open. So I came up with the idea because I was so moved with the oath that uh, I have experienced seeing that they're making an oath to be faithful to the party that I said to her, you know, I want to be a communist in my life. So she slid up. I still remember her face. She was like, I have a smile on her face. There she got me. The prosecutor couldn't get me, but she's going to be the hero. I could see it in her eyes and her facial expression. She says, okay, so come to school on Shabbos. I say, yeah, but remember you taught us that a communist, he only says the emes, the truth. And if I go to school on Shabbos, I can no longer be a communist. And I want to be a communist in my life. Therefore, I must keep the Shabbos. So what is she supposed to do now? She sees that I'm sort of a trained child. So she pats me in the back. I still remember that pat in the back. She says, okay, you can go back to class. Wow. Yeah, so, but that okay. was not the end. It was, the, you know, at the end, we had a counselor, a Jewish girl. She was maybe 16, 17. I was nine. And she was like sort of our counselor, you know, giving us that young blood and being an example of what a communist is supposed to be, a, Jew a Jewish girl. So she she was, you know, youngish, and she decided she's going to teach me a lesson. So she says, I want you to get up and promise that this Shabbos you will come to, sh to school. So I'm looking at her and I'm saying, you know, I went through the teacher and the prosecutor. So who are you that I'm going to, to fall for? So I get up and I'm saying, hmm, I'm making a promise. So again, she lifts up and I say that I will not come this Shabbos to school or any Shabbos in my life. I'm not coming to school. So she turned red and started screaming. And the class started verbally attacking me and even some of them physically, how dare you speak to a counselor like this? And figured, ah, oh, you guys are Shratzim, who are you? I, 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 you know, greater than you, I overcame you. You are nobody in my life. That's yeah. how, you know. Wow, a very different world than growing up in uh, suburbia America and Little League and so on. Okay, Rabbi, I don't want to take too much of your time, but tell us about the first time you came to the Rebbe after all of this. You got finally got out of Russia, and you're able to finally come to the Rebbe who you knew of, but had never seen, had never seen even the photograph, and knew that the Rebbe was concerned for you and taking care of you, and then finally you're able to come. How old were you? Give us a little taste of what that was like, and then we'll open it up. If anyone has a specific question, we'll be respectful of the Rabbi's time and not take too much more time. It's I, I, I just turned 15 then, mm -hmm. and we were... Um, my father was going to go see the Rebbe. And I pleaded with my father, I want to come with. I have seen the, the Rebbe's picture in Russia because in the in our, in our uh, call it dining room, living room, we had in the wall built in an Oron Kadesh. Wow. An ark. 
And you know, as every boy wants to find out what's hidden that the father wouldn't show, I found the key and I opened it up, the door. And in the door, there was, you know, glued in the picture of a Jew in a, in a, in a hat. I right away, you know, put the two, the two and two together. That's the rabbi, it was the, the picture of the rabbi in Yutrat. So being raised that we have a, a rebbe and that the rebbe is is uh, we're on the rebbe's mind, on the rebbe's mind, we were eager to go and see the rebbe. So I remember we came at the time of slichas this time of the year, right before Rosh Hashanah. You were living in Eretz Yisrael then, correct? You were living, we were in, living in Eretz Yisrael, yeah. And I, we landed in New York. We were greeted by. Some of my previous teachers that got out earlier, like there's a rabbi Stolen in California, who greeted us and he said, fast, 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 run to the mikveh, seven o'clock, the rabbi is coming out to sleep us. So we were there waiting, the rabbi comes in, we make the baruch shechiyana, we heard the rabbi say omen, and at night, the, that day the rabbi went to the ohel, to pray on his grave, father's of, of his father-in-law's gravesite, and he when right after Mariv, he started a song, and we were dancing, and when it came to Rosh Hashanah, we were the Rebbe wanted to make sure that we we're there, right there by the Tkias, and we heard and the Rebbe sounded the shofar. Yeah, the Rebbe was blowing the shofar. And, you know, the the picture of it is that people would write letters to the Rebbe called the Pan. And the secretary would bring those sacks of, of letters and would put them in front of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe would put out his shafers and he wants us to stay right behind him. And his kids were squeezed in to the front. So we see what the Rebbe is doing. You know, the chauffeurs and the shechiyono and everything that he makes and the way he puts them together. And we see that he puts his stalas over the over the pidienas, over the notes. And he there's a lot of crying. The Rebbe is crying his heart out to Hashem to pray for the entire Jewish people, for every Jew. So, you know, we felt very much like we came home. We came home to with uh, the dream that we had to be by the Rebbe. And during the month of Tishrei, the Rebbe always wanted us to be right near him. He wanted that we should sing songs that we sing in, in uh, you know, on the underground. He wanted to, each one of us should come over to the Rebbe, say L'chaim to him. I remember the night came, the Rebbe wanted to know my name and how old I am. And he he was treating us very much individually. And we didn't even understand. We thought that that's standard. We didn't even understand that the rabbi made a special point in, in uh, treating us and in really showing his affection for the Russian Jews. Rabbi, this has been amazing. I mean, really an eye-opener for us. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a very short, quick question, Please unmute yourself. Otherwise, we're going to let Rabbi Nutter go. Rabbi, thank you so much for sharing this. It's the whole world that's uh, unfamiliar to us American couch potatoes who grew up, uh, you know, with not, well, our idea of hardship was we didn't have blueberry muffins. So we really appreciate your time and sharing this with us. Um, again, if somebody has a quick question that they want to ask, otherwise we want to let Rabbi Nutter go. We appreciate his time so much. And it's Yantif and everybody is crazy busy. Anybody otherwise will say good night. Well, can you come back again and talk to us <laughs> what you did in Chicago in the in the 80s? I was at a preschool with the refuseniks of what went on in Chicago. I'd like to hear a story. Okay, and Rabbi, that's it. You have to come back now. You know, we don't get too many if requests. It's, it's not on the Tuesday night because <laughs> I okay, just so you will make an we have a Tuesday night, we have class, we have a seminar for three hours straight. Okay. So a, a, a different evening would be a little bit easier. It's than just sold. Night. Okay, that's it. After Yontif, we'll make a special exception and we'll have you instead of a Tuesday, we'll have you on a different night and we'll hear about that. Well, absolutely. Thank you for that suggestion. Anybody else have a quick question? 
that they want to ask Rabbi Nuttick. Otherwise, we'll say goodnight. And thank you so much for your time, Rabbi. Gemara